Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jordan Hand. I'm a developer on the Open Enclave SDK project. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what the Open Enclave SDK is, what problems it solves, um, what we as a project have been doing for the last 12 months, where we're headed, and then um, we're going to take some time to, to go through a demo of what does it look like to develop an application with the Open Enclave SDK, run it, debug it, um, and just kind of dive into this, some of the tooling around how to develop these applications. So um, I'm going to start by just framing what is the problem that the Open Enclave SDK seeks to solve. Uh, if you've seen another presentation on confidential computing. If you saw Stephen Wally's talk on Monday, you've probably heard some of these concepts before, but I just want to go over them for a minute and so that we have a baseline for talking about all the other topics. So for a long time, we've known how to protect data when it's at rest. So this is like on disk when, you're, when you turn your computer off, you can encrypt the disk, and when you reboot, you enter some password <clears throat> that can be used to decrypt data on disk. Um, moving to in transit, this is things like TLS. You know, you can encrypt data from point A to point B, but then once it's on the the destination computer or the source computer, it is decrypted when it's used. So the problem that we're trying to solve is how do you protect data when it's in use, in, in memory, um, and how do you protect it from maybe components that are on, on the same physical hardware? Um, because to operate on the data, you need to, to be able to hold it in memory. So that's kind of the the framing of, of the, what the problem solves. And there's a, a number of hardware technologies, um, Intel SGX, ARM Trust Zone, um, kind of a different model, but uh, AMD's SEV technologies kind of operate in this space. And this is hardware isolation of some memory CPU state. Um, it kind of depends on, on the hardware technology, but um, protection from other parts in the system. So how can you silo off code and data to so that it can't be viewed, can't be modified uh, by other parts of a system? So that brings us to the Open Enclave SDK. So what is it? It's a C and C++ SDK for developing apps that target these hardware platforms. So if you want to build an SGX app, if you want to build an app on ARM Trust Zone, we provide libraries, we provide a consistent API interface to run, deploy that application um, on those platforms. So uh, another principle that we've kind of sought out to, to make as a part of the SDK is that we want it to be fully open source and transparent and not tied to a specific cloud vendor or a specific hardware vendor. Um, and we want to make sure that all the code running with your trusted application code is auditable by users um, and by anyone who wants to look at it. So we provide libraries that run inside of this trusted environment that I'm talking about, this, this trusted code and data silo. Um, all of that should be auditable by whoever the, the trusted party is. So this is the application developer, the person running the application. Um, we also don't want to tie these applications to a specific cloud vendor. So obviously I work for Microsoft, but we, want these applications to be usable anywhere where this hardware exists. Um, beyond that, we want the trusted compute base. So this is like the amount, you can basically think of it as the amount of attack surface of an application. We want that to be potentially as small as possible, but also 
we want it to be composable. So that means that if you have different components, maybe your application needs certain components, like we're going to talk later about, maybe you want libc access. You want access to the standard C APIs. Um, because your application is very challenging to write without it. You can add that as a layer to your Open Enclave SDK application, along with other libraries that you may need. But we also want to make it possible for applications that don't necessarily need these things. They're maybe doing something pretty trivial inside of, of the Enclave. Um, we want to be able to allow them to reduce the code size of the application as much as possible. Um, and that just helps with a auditability of the code. Can you make sure that all the code running inside your application is secure? It's really hard to do that when you have a, a very large uh, TCB, a very large amount of code running in inside of an enclave. And then we also want support for multiple platforms. So we target Windows and Linux, and we try our best to keep uh, feature parity with both of those platforms. And we just want to provide a single experience that doesn't change too much um, when you cross OS platforms. And so we'll talk a little bit later about, about what that means. So this is kind of the basic structure, and we'll, we'll dive more into this in a minute. But this is the basic structure of an Enclave application. So you have normal application code. You can think of this as just like, you know, you write your main function in C and, and you run it. This is just regular application code. Um, as part of that application code, you have an untrusted host component. So everything in red is not trusted in terms of, of hardware isolation. So it's outside of the hardware isolation boundary. Um, untrusted host that kind of serves as a connector between the Enclave application and the, the rest of the machine. And so we'll talk a minute um, in a minute about more about that. Um, the host OS, including the kernel, is also untrusted, but there, it can do some, some operations on our behalf without, still without having access to the data. So the only part that is trusted in terms of inside the hardware isolation boundary is the Enclave application. So this is this green piece. Um, and so this includes some runtime libraries that the Open Enclave SDK provides, as well as the application code that the developer writes. Um, and something else just to note really quick is that if you have multiple enclaves running on the same machine, um, again, it, it is maybe hardware dependent, but typically these applications are isolated from each other as well. Um, so then the Open Enclave SDK seeks to abstract most platform specific details. So you can see the, the green pieces are what the Open Enclave SDK offers. And then the orange pieces we typically take from other projects. So for SGX, we use Intel's uh, platform software libraries, their uh, DCAP libraries, which are used for attestation. Um, we use their Linux kernel driver, their Windows kernel drivers. Um, so we we seek to, for sp hardware specific stuff, keep that out of the project. Um, similarly, on Trust Zone, we build pretty much entirely on top of Opti. And so we, we leverage that project pretty heavily. So one thing that is important to note is that an Enclave application running just in complete isolation is often not very useful. You need some connection out to your normal world so that you can do things like, I have data that is encrypted. I operated it on, on it inside the Enclave application. 
Now I want to send it over the network to another machine. It's encrypted, but I want to send it over the network to another machine. If I'm just running inside the Enclave, I can't do that. So we need to provide a way for the Enclave application to talk to the outside host application. And so if you're familiar with SGX, great, that's easy. The Enclave actually has access to all of the host memory for the, the containing process. So the Enclave lives as, as a carved out section of memory in the process, and it can access um, anything outside that's also in the process. For Trust Zone, that's not so simple. Um, there, there is not a shared, you know, the simple shared memory model. And so for the OE SDK, we wanted to wrap that up so that so that it looks consistent across all platforms. We want to restrict how communication between the Enclave and the host works um, to what will work on every platform. So what we have is a tool called Edge that is called OE Edgerator. Um, it takes in a definition file, which is basically just a list of functions that are E calls, so these are calls from the host to the Enclave, and O calls, these are calls from the Enclave back to the host. And we'll take a look later just at, at what one of those files looks like. But you can basically think of it as a, as a header file. We just provide function definitions. And then the OE Edgerator tool will generate um, basically glue code, so code that will do on different platforms different things, potentially uh, an IPC call, potentially um, marshalling memory between um, the host and the enclave. And the important part is that it does a lot of things for you that if you were to try to do on your own would be easy to mess up. So for example, marshalling data from the host. So data from the host is inherently untrusted. In SGX, if you want to, you could just read data directly from the host. but it, you're, that leaves you susceptible to time of, tech, time of check, time of use attacks. You could, well, yeah, that, that's basically it. So the, the edge code, the glue code, will marshal data so that it, it's copied from the host to the enclave. When you're operating on it in the enclave, you can be sure that once you've validated the data, once you've ensured that there's no dangerous pointers, no potential for leaking data, that it is all inside the Enclave memory space. So this is basically what the Enclave runtime libraries look like. So we have a core library, the Open Enclave core library, which basically serves as an adapter between the platform specific libraries and the rest of the OESDK libraries. So on, like I said before, on SGX, we have the Intel platform software libraries. On Trust Zone, we have the Opti APIs. And so we try to build a consistent interface on top of that that then uses platform specific APIs as needed. Um, Above that, we have a syscall layer. So this is, we've tried to implement a large number of POSIX syscalls. Um, and on Windows, this is actually the exact same. We, even though it's running on Windows from inside the Enclave, you still use POSIX APIs. Um, to, and that's, that's an, again, an attempt to uh, make the experience the same across multiple platforms. So you can actually take an Enclave application. They're all, all Enclave applications. The code running in the Enclave is uh, an ELF binary. And you can actually take the same ELF binary that you're running on Linux and run it on Windows without recompiling the same exact binary. So we have the POSIX syscall layer, um, which is primarily a, a number of O calls, uh, calls from the Enclave to the host. And then the syscalls are actually run on the host and the result is returned to the Enclave. So these are primarily 
untrusted calls, um, but they serve an important purpose for accessing disk, ac accessing a uh, network. So we provide other libraries inside the Enclave to help you do that securely, but um, this is primarily a layer that leverages the untrusted host operating system. Um, we have a, a version of MuscleWebC that you can build your Enclave application on top of. So we want it to look as close to developing a normal C application as possible. Um, as part of that, we have libraries that that call into the Cisco, you know, the muscle library calls into the Cisco layer for doing and many of the standard C functions. And we also provide, we publish, you know, what these syscalls are as part of the SDK. And so you can choose which syscalls you want to use, um, which syscalls you want to not, you know, not allow. Um, so then on top of that, we have, a ver again, a version of embed TLS for cryptography uh, operations. And then on top of that, we have an attestation layer. So this is for generating um, attestation evidence. So this is, you know, in SGX, this is often an, an attestation quote. Um, and then finally, we provide a C++ library built that we run on top of MuscleMC so you, that you can actually write C++ applications inside of the Enclave. So um, I mostly went through all of these, so we'll just kind of skip through each of these slides. Um, something else that we provide is host libraries for things like Enclave creation, um, interfacing with platform-specific libraries like I talked about before, um, and as well as uh, the kind of primitives for doing the, the enclave to host communication. Additionally, we have a separate host verify library. And so this is for evidence that is attestation evidence that is generated from within an enclave. We have a standalone library that can be run on any, any machine that can verify that evidence. Um, and so there's actually a lot of current work going on to standardize this across um, trusted execution environment platforms um, because attestation evidence looks different for different hardware vendors, different platforms. Um, and so we want to provide a consistent API to generate this evidence and then verify the evidence. So that's actually some, some really cool work that people are doing in the project right now. And we're kind of defining what that looks like. Um, something else that we've strived to do that I talked about a, a little bit um, is make the, cons the experience look consistent on regardless of the host OS, um, because the idea is that the host OS doesn't really matter. What you care about is the, the code running inside the trusted ex execution environment. And so we don't want the application to really have to care about what the host looks like. So we've provided, again, a, a consistent API layer that then calls into platform-specific libraries on, um, on Linux or Windows. So for example, for the host verify library, we have the cryptographic operations on Windows use bcrypt, they use Win32 APIs, they use the Windows uh, C runtime. On Linux, they use OpenSSL, they use POSIX APIs. Uh, but from the application, from the, the OE application, none of that really matters. They just use OE specific APIs. And then we, I talked about this at the beginning with kind of composable uh, TCB size, but we want to allow application developers to make the choice between code size and attack surface and usability. And that's not a yes or no decision that's often a spectrum of 
my application is is just too hard to write without certain libraries. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to just allow any code to run in the Enclave. Um, so giving application developers the ability to make choices about what what code is running in their Enclave and being able to add or take away from that code size is, is an important kind of tenet of the SDK. So another thing that the Open Enclave project seeks to provide is kind of tooling to make developing these applications a lot easier. So we want tooling for for signing and for quote verification and and compilation to be pretty pretty much the same across platforms. Um, that's another thing that is kind of in progress right now. Um, integration with debugger platforms and and IDEs to make whatever tools you're using um, work with Enclave applications. And then uh, modes for simulation and emulation to when you don't have access to SGX hardware or Trust Zone enabled hardware, that you can still test your application, develop rapidly, and then when you can deploy on hardware, you just pick it up and it works. So um, some really exciting work that we've been doing in the last 12 months is adding support for debuggers to more platforms. So we have a GDB plugin that kind of has been the, the mainstay of debugging for OE applications. Um, and I'll, I'll demo that in a little bit. Um, recently, we've also come out with a WinDBG plugin, a Visual Studio plugin, so you can see in the bottom left, um, our Visual Studio Code plugin a lot just works the same as as any C and C plus plus debugging um, that you would be used to, um, and we have the same experience on full Visual Studio as well. And then we, I talked a little bit about simulation and emulation. So on SGX, we have a, a almost full simulation mode. So we basically have implemented everything that SGX would do itself. Um, and we've, we've written a simulator so that pretty much everything behaves the same as it does in SGX, but running on any x86 hardware. Um, I'd say pretty much we don't support attestation, um, primarily because keys are typically in hardware and there's really no no secure way to generate something that that you could use that would really be usable. Um, and then on the Trust Zone Opti side, we have instructions for running in a QMU emulator. And so that's kind of the same thing. You don't need, you don't even need ARM hardware to run an OE application for Opti. So what do we want to do in the project looking forward? One thing that we've really looked into recently, we've been discussing a lot in our meetings, um, and I'll talk a little bit later, but um, everyone is welcome, the community is welcome to, to join in on any of these discussions, um, is a consistent plugin API so that a new trusted ex execution environment can add support and add support for that platform to the OESDK in a consistent way. So we want to provide a set of APIs that a, an, a platform must implement uh, to then support all the other features I talked about that layer on top of that. Um, Another thing is is a discoverable support matrix. So we support maybe some features are can be supported on SGX, and then some features, you know, some of those same features don't work on 
trust zone for a number of reasons. Maybe the, the memory model is too different to support a, a certain feature. Um, but we want to make sure that the application can figure out which features are supported on which platforms, um, preferably at runtime. And then the application can, can make decisions based on, on that support matrix. And then another thing we're striving towards in the, the coming months is a stable public API. So we are a pre v1 project. And so, so far we try to keep the API as stable as possible, but some things we just realized that, hey, we did this two years ago and this doesn't make sense anymore. So um, we've had to make some breaking changes to the API, but we want to, in the next couple releases, get to a point where that API is stable. Um, and so those are also discussions that are, that are going on right now. So um, this is actually from the, a diagram from one of the designs for creating a plugin API for plot for various platforms. Um, and I've actually I've linked the the markdown file for this design. So all of our designs go into they're reviewed as markdown files in PRs. They go into the repo. Um, you can go take a look at any of those designs. And so we really want to invite people to to come be a part of the project and help us make these decisions. If you want to develop applications for, for these platforms, but maybe you see a, a feature that isn't there or some, something that you'd like to behave differently, we want to invite people to, to come join us because these discussions are happening right now. Pretty much none of this is set in stone. So let's talk about something that is, is fun for me to look at is how the project has grown and changed in the last 12 months. So um, some of the other contributors to the project gave a presentation on on the Open Enclave SDK at this conference last year. Um, and so I want to take a look at what has changed in that time and kind of what what the project looks like now. So we're seeing about 20 to 60 commits per week. That's actually down a little bit from 2019. Um, that's 1,200 commits in total, which is down um, qu actually quite a bit from 2019. And you would think, you would look at that and you'd say, well, does, I mean, are people leaving the project? What's going on? But I actually think it points more to stability in the last 12 months, there's been a lot less churn than the previous 12 months in kind of core pieces of the code base. And so there was kind of a, a period where there were tons of changes going in, um, lots of, of moving pieces, lots of things just didn't, didn't work quite right. We also added a large number of features. We added support for Opti. So that was just a lot of churn in the code base. And we're kind of settling down to a point where we don't, we don't need quite so many uh, commits per week. We, things, things are actually pretty stable at this point. And so we're just trying to, to refine it more. And you can see that the project is, is growing in that um, there, we have over double the number of forks from 2019. We've done four releases. Um, in the last 12 months, and we're looking to kind of come up with a, a consistent release cadence um, to, to get consistent releases out there. So this year we had 61 unique contributors to the project. Something amazing is we actually had 63 unique reviewers. So that means that almost everybody who's contributing to the project, who's submitting pull requests, who's writing code, is also reviewing other people's code. And I think that's really cool for a project. It's maybe not something you see in a lot of projects that people are really interested in, in helping out others. Um, I think we have a really cool culture of accepting new contributions, new contributors, and really helping out new contributors to, to get them started on the project. So that's, that's actually really cool to see. Um, we also have committers from five different organizations. Um, so this is a project that started out as a Microsoft project, 
was donated to the Linux Foundation about a year ago. And we're seeing the, the contributors to the project grow outside of the bounds of Microsoft. And that's really cool to see. Um, something else that we've been kind of working towards is making all of our communications open. When you start as a project inside of a company, um, sometimes that, that growing into the open can be challenging. Um, but I think we've done a great job of, we've recently made every meeting that we have about the project is completely open to the public. Um, we provide links on our mailing list, links on our GitHub repository. Um, and there's a, a calendar of, of when these meetings occur. Um, so anyone in the community can join any meeting we have about the project. Um, we've created a number of special interest groups around attestation, um, APIs and architecture, testing and tooling. And so these groups kind of have their, their own separate meetings that again, anyone can attend. And we, it's, it's allowed the project to move a lot faster in that um, as, as a smaller group, maybe you make decisions about attestation. You have people in these meetings that all have a background in, in the code base. They understand what the needs of attestation are. And that allows those discussions to move a lot faster. Um, and then something else we're moving towards is open CI. So this is um, anyone can access any of our CI runs. And we're trying to get to a point where anyone can actually run their own CI runs on, on the project infrastructure. Um, yeah. So. For the rest of the time, I'm going to go through a demo and we're just going to look at what does it look like to develop an OE application? Um, what does it look like to, to debug an application? What does that tooling look like? So let's see if I can switch over pretty seamlessly. All right. So sorry, just a minute. So here I have a demo application um, that I, I wrote a little bit ago. It's pretty simple. Um, we have a, a host side. So let's look at that first, because that's going to be the most familiar to most people. Just a minute. OK. So. We have a main function. This is just you know your your standard C application. Um, we have some creation code. So this is setting up the application, the uh, enclave, telling it which what's the enclave binary I want to run. Um, some flags so you can see I passed a debug flag and um, simulation flag. So this allows me to run in simulation mode. Um, and this allows me to attach a debugger to my Enclave code. And then I just pass all that to a, a create, and that, cre that creates a siloed um, section of, of code and data um, for me to run my Enclave in. And then we'll come back to this in a minute, but we also have a call um, into the Enclave, and we get a value out, and we uh, print it out, and that's it. That's all the application does at this point. And let's look at what, how, how I'm going to build that host application. It, it will look pretty, pretty familiar. The only thing that um, maybe looks different from your traditional application is that you can see this tool that I talked about earlier, this OE Edgerator tool, um, and I'm going to pass it my my interface definition file, and it will generate a C file that implements that glue code that I talked about earlier. Otherwise, it's, it's just pretty much um, what you would expect. So let's take a look at the interface definition. So you can see I have, um, it, it, it's kind of like a, a pseudo C-like language, but uh, I can define trusted 
function calls. So this is calls from the host to the enclave. And this is just, it will, this is to provide um, Edgerator some definition for how it will uh, generate the, the glue code. I could also write an untrusted function, which is a call from the enclave to the host. And it, it basically looks the same. Um, I can give parameters. Um, I can pass pointers, you know, etc. So then in the enclave, you can see all I have is the definition for whatever E calls, whatever enclave calls I defined in EDL. So I defined the interface in EDL, and then here I have what the implementation of that function does. So I have a function that just adds two numbers that were passed in as parameters. Um, and you can see that Edgerator also generated a header file for me, um, which defines this function. And it def um, generates a host side header file as well. So on the enclave, there's a little more interesting things going on um, in the build. So you can see here, it, it looks kind of the same as the host. We generated some, we generated a, a C stub file for the enclave side. Um, we're compiling, you know, the same same way we did before. And then on the enclave side, we also want to sign the binary so that when it's loaded by SGX, the signature is validated. Um, by to be a trusted party and in the attestation report for the enclave it will show who signed it what was the the signature contents um, what was the hash of the binary that was loaded into the enclave um, so those can all be validated at runtime by by some other party that wants to to trust the enclave running so here we just generated a key pair and use the OE sign tool, which will generate a platform specific signature for the binary. Um, actually, really quick, you also notice that there's a comp file that I passed at signing time. And this defines some basic things about the enclave. So, this is how many memory pages I'm going to load, um, how many thread structures I have. And this is kind of platform specific information. Um, is the enclave debuggable? If I don't allow it to be debuggable, then I can't pass that debug flag that we saw earlier and I can't attach a debugger. So there's kind of some, some configurations you can do at signing time so that if you want to sign an application for debug mode or for you know your production mode you can do that without changing the code so let's go ahead and build this application um, i'm going to just we already i previously installed the oesdk um, at this location, at this opt open enclave location. And this file that I'm sourcing is just to set up my path so that it can find my package config files, basically. OK, so that was pretty easy. I built the application. And then let's go ahead and run it. So I, we can see in our host, we just told the enclave, add the number one and two and print the result. And so you can see we added the number one and two, and we got three. Um, so let's look at what does it look like to attach a debugger to set breakpoints. So we have this OEGDB, which is basically just a, a thin wrapper and a Python plugin to GDB. Um, and we will go ahead and run it, run the application under that. I can't quite 
see the bottom. There we go. So let's go ahead and just break on main really quick. So this is in the untrusted portion. This is, you know, no, no OE plugin magic going on here. This is just normal GDB. Okay, great. So we have, um, we have our, our main application, we, we break there. So let's look at, can we set a breakpoint inside the enclave? So we want to check out what is what is this function doing? Obviously, this is very simple, but um, you can see how it would be useful in in other cases. So we are going to set a breakpoint on the add nums equal. Great. Um, this is actually you can see. It set a breakpoint in sample underscore u dot c. That's actually still on the host. Anything, the underscore u is the generated host code. Um, so we're actually going to break really quick in the glue code. Um, but if we continue again, we see that we have a, a corresponding function inside the enclave that we've uh, broken on. So we're going to print a, print b. Great, we got the values we expected. Continue and we, we exit normally. So this is basically looks you know as you'd expect. This is the exact same as attaching GDB to any other application. Under the hood, there's a lot more going on um, for how do you you know make the stack look the same across the you know, the host to enclave function call boundary, how do you marshal parameters, et cetera. Um, but from a usability perspective, it basically just looks the same. So cool. So that is pretty much all I have. You can start uh, dropping questions in, oh, just a minute. You can start dropping questions in the chat and I will, um, answer them as they come in. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so first question is, is this only targeted for cloud or does this apply generically such as to embedded systems? So it kind of depends on what hardware you want to target. So for um, the ARM Trust Zone uh, Opti support, this is primarily on Em embedded systems, IoT devices. I don't really, I haven't seen much use of Opti outside of, of that space. Um, maybe maybe it exists, but not that I have seen. Um, a lot of SGX usage is in, in cloud on server class devices, but um, there is also SGX support on Client devices. So, so to, pretty much to answer your question, no, it's not just for cloud. Um, it just kind of depends on on what hardware you want to target. But the SDK in general is is aimed at any any enclave applications you want to develop for any hardware pop. Um, this is kind of a similar question. Does Open Enclave target microcontrollers like ARM's TF-M? Um, we target any ARM platforms that support Opti. So I don't know a ton about the, the ARM board space, but anywhere you can run Opti, you can run Open Enclave. Okay, does the project use some kind of security test slash verification on the code? So we have a number of people that do um, security audits of the code. We don't have, I guess, I don't, I don't know exactly what the question is asking if there's a more maybe formal security verification um, 
that you're looking for there's that I'm not familiar with, but we do have people looking at the code, um, looking for security vulnerabilities. We address them as, as they come up. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. What are some of the milestones on the roadmap for the OESDK in general? So this is pretty much what I talked about earlier. This is um, a stable API is a really big one. Um, the as as an SDK platform we, that wants to kind of target multiple hardware vendors and um, make it easy for anyone to write an application and run it wherever. Having an API that doesn't change is pretty important for that. Um, we don't want to be breaking our users on every release. So that's, I would say, a, a pretty big milestone that we're shooting for. Um, another, another thing that we're shooting for is making it easy for hardware vendors or people that want to add support for more platforms to come in and do that in a consistent way. Um, how can you know what's the advice we give to people? What is the are the platforms and tool the tooling we give to allow people to implement that? Okay, so for the question earlier about um, does Open Enclave target microcontrollers like ARMS TF M? Um, someone Dave on the project has answered that. We only support TF-A, not TF-M. What OS is run inside the Enclave? So again, it depends. Like I said, on Trust Zone, it's running, it's running Opti OS. On SGX, there really is no operating system. We actually have specifically built the, you know, the libc and the in the library layering just directly on top of. OE um, library code. So the the kind of syscall layer that I talked about earlier relies primarily on the host operating system. But other than that, there's no operating system running inside of the SGX enclave. Um, OK, that's all I'm seeing so far. So I'll give, um, I think we, we only have like a couple minutes left, but I'll give a couple minutes to wait for any other questions to come in. Um, is there already any use case in other projects? Um, I don't quite know what this is asking. I guess does, it, oh, I see. Is the Open Enclave SDK used by other projects? So we do have, um, a few projects that we do know use the Open Enclave SDK as as the basis for their um, projects. So that is the the CCF Confidential Computing Framework. Um, you can go check that out on GitHub. They are built on top of the Open Enclave SDK. Um, there's also a project that was announced recently called SGX LKL, and this is an attempt to run the uh, Linux kernel as as the Linux kernel library, um, which is a, a library OS that mostly reuses all of the Linux kernel code to run that inside of SGX so that you can run unmodified Linux applications inside of an SGX enclave. Um, and that that project is built on top of the open enclave SDK as well. All right, so it looks like that's about it for questions. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I will probably be in Slack for a little bit after this and I'll be in the Confidential Computing Consortium booth for about an hour um, in, a, in a couple of hours here. So thanks everybody. Have a nice day.